Have you ever found yourself after a game of D&D debating over a particular rule that came up and trying to figure out, as a group, how to break it? As a DM, do you get that feeling of dread when your player asks, if you look at it this way? Well, we decided to turn that into a podcast. A group of DMs come together every episode as we discuss how rules is written. We can figure out how to maximize what we can do with a rule and how we can use other rules to break the game. Each episode, we will be joined by a guest, including DMs from some of our favorite podcasts, and get a sneak peek behind the DM screen from some of our favorite shows as they share their own thoughts and experiences on a particular rule and how it has affected their games. Please feel free to jump in on our discussions by leaving us a comment on Podbean, iTunes, Google Play, or Stitcher, or feel free to email me at dm at dndraw.com, or send us a tweet to at rules as written and let us know how the rule may have come up during one of your games or how you figured out a way to break the game that we didn't discuss so thanks for joining us i'm tony this is rachel this is bethany my name is scott i'm the host and dm for a dungeons and dragons 5e actual play podcast called seasons of skyrand we've been up and running for just about a year and as of very recently i've Joined a podcast that runs Blades in the Dark called Mark Experience. This episode, we're going to be discussing grappling, followed by a focus on survival and travel. But I think okay. we'll just go ahead and we were going to jump into grappling first. Okay. Anybody in this group like grappling? Tony does. Tony okay, likes grappling a lot. I no, never grapple because I, I never, never play well, strong characters. <laughs> I play strong. I usually play like a strength based character. I have a lot, and that's the that's a great mechanic. I think for it, I use uh, my character for for Bethany's campaign. Uthal just yeah, it makes sense. Plus eleven to athletics, so. Which is really fun when there's like a little scraggly caster, like a little cultist, and he's like, mm -hmm. you know, his character comes hulking over and just sort of says, and I grapple him. And I'm like, <laughs> well, let's do a check on it. But it's kind of a foregone conclusion at this point, because that guy has a strength of minus two. And, <laughs> um, and he's almost, you know, there's no point for him. Uh, one thing I think that has come up is the biggest contentious point for grapple for us is what does it mean to be grappled? Because everyone's always disappointed and wants it to be more like, ha ha, I have them grappled and now they can't attack me. Uh, but well, you can still attack. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Can oh, yeah. still attack and wreck. They just like can't move. Right. Yep. Yeah. yeah. It's really just movement, which I think is kind of a letdown. I think that's why a lot of players like Rachel saying, who likes grapple? People yeah. are like, eh. I think because when you picture it, you picture them like bear hugging you. So like your arms are pinned, your leg, like, you, know, you can't move. So that's technically the restrained condition. Well, but it actually, in a sense, grapples more like you've collared them, you know, yeah. like yeah. like in an old fashioned mm. cowboy movie where they go up and they grab the guy by the shirt collar and hold him there and are like, ha ha, you know, yeah. I got you. Um, I don't, that's my understanding. That's how I always visualize it. I mean, maybe without shirt collars on monsters. <laughs> or maybe with shirt collars. They could be dressing up. They could yeah. be, yeah. <laughs> they could <laughs> be little bow ties. <laughs> but uh, I know Rachel, for, for Chris, Rachel's husband in my game, every time Grapples come up, he's been gravely disappointed because he thinks it's yeah. restrained. <laughs> yeah. Yep. And I'm like, no, oh, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. <laughs> just can't walk away. That's literally all you've done is stop them from walking away. Yep. But then, then you can, like, haul them around, too. You can take True. a guy and, like, take him around a corner, get him out of the rest of the fight. Or Yeah, I think that's a good point. I think maybe it's a lack of imagination on our part. We just are like, I want the most direct solution, which is usually killing them. When I think Grapple <laughs> does give you a more, I don't know, more options. Yeah. Well, one of the benefits of it was in a recent session we had one of the enemies like kept trying to run away and move about and just stayed away from us. <laughs> yeah. So I know I will grapple them and they will stay put. Yeah, mm. that's true. I was going to say like grappling the rangers or the casters or people like that really limits what they can do. Cause they yeah. Need that space. They just kind of flail at you ineffectually. Uh, yeah. It, it's been very effective against casters. I think as a DM, I don't use it a lot because I'm often playing as 
creatures that wouldn't grapple or mm -hmm. casters who are bad at grappling. <laughs> yeah. That's why we need to start playing casters with all touch spells and just walk in and be like, <laughs> grapple me. Do it. Do it. And be like, <laughs> do some shocking grasp sort of yeah. nonsense. Yeah. yeah. Some inflict wounds. Yeah. Pull some of that out of your sleeve. One thing that has come up with uh, Chody's character, Uthal, yeah, he's he's the grapple guy for sure. Um, but he has the ability to grapple like creatures that are larger than him, which I think you could normally do. But he's a goliath, so he counts as a size larger. And this came up in a fight with a giant crocodile where he's like, so uh, so I'd like to grapple the giant crocodile. And in my head, I'm like, how does that work? It's a giant crocodile. I mean, I know you're a big <laughs> dude, but you're still like a medium-sized creature. But we were looking at the rules and I mean. Yeah, it, if you yeah. count as large, then yeah. <laughs> It was really sad for that giant crocodile. Like it was all over. <laughs> it's really sad for a lot of you that those things. <laughs> I, I picture it like I'm grabbing like his his leg or maybe like his jaw or something, so he can't open it. Trying to like hold him in place. I guess yeah. It is hard to visualize grapples. Yeah. Oh, it's really hard. And I think for me, when I'm playing characters, I play a lot of like deck space characters, so they're not really very good at athletics. And it's great that you could use acrobatics to like get out of a grapple but it doesn't help you when you're trying to grapple someone <laughs> so i always ask like so tony any chance like in this particular scenario i could sort of like i don't know use my dexterity to sort of like i don't know wrap my arm around someone's arm and use acrobatics <laughs> and he always says no but he's wise yep. yeah. yeah he knows about he it's knows a about slippery precedence. slope <laughs> it as is soon as you do slope. it once <laughs> Yeah, I mean, strength-based characters get so few like skill bonuses. <sighs> Giving them grapple true. is the least you can do. <laughs> yeah, like, it's just to give them like, well, they have so little else going on in their life. We might as well. <laughs> hey, I know the feeling. <laughs> it's okay. Your character has other stuff. She's a paladin. She doesn't just have strength. She also has lay on hands, <laughs> which I could grapple and do. This is yeah. true. Another thing that's come up, and this isn't just with grappling, but especially with grappling, is you're supposed to have a free hand to grapple with. And I think the way most of us play, we don't have a lot of free hands. Like, mm -mm. you know, I mean, often, unless you're a caster, you have like a sword and a shield or two swords or your or two handed weapon. Two yeah. And technically, you're supposed to have a free hand. Yeah. If you're wielding a two handed weapon, a lot of times, then technically, if you grapple, you can't use the two handed weapon. Unless it's versatile. Right. Less it's versatile. Yeah. I don't but, know. But you could still hold on to it or use that as part of the grapple, like over somebody's chest and hold them in tight. Hey, baby. Yeah. I've let Tony, <laughs> I, I kind of have allowed some some flexibility on the free hand thing because often Tony's characters has a sword and a shield and I'll sort of let him use the, the shield arm to mm. kind of grapple somebody. I'm, I'm giving him a, a half hug with the shield behind him. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's still nice. <laughs> But uh, another thing that's come up is, um, I think this was in your game, Out of the Abyss, Tony, where we've had weaker characters who were grappled and oh, gosh. are unable to escape. <laughs> and then you're like, I gotta need some help from a party member. But you're trying, like, how do you let them help? Do you, like, is it just the help action? Or how do you allow someone to break a grapple for somebody else? Well, has that come <laughs> up in your game, Scott? We've certainly had grappling in our game. But unfortunately, none of my players have been kind enough to try to help the others out. <laughs> <laughs> I, Sorry, not man. directly with the help action. I, there was one situation when they were being grappled by these really big, strong guys, uh, like plus nine to strength. Oh, gosh. And mostly it was just, I want to shoot them to distract them while they're holding my friend. Like, oh, Indirect okay. help. <laughs> like, yeah, if you kill them, they're going to let them go. But And then there was another time we were in a cave and i had brought in what was essentially cave fishers i don't know uh -huh. if you've seen those mm -hmm. big yeah, white they're... scorpion oh. crab looking things Not cute. <laughs> just shoot out this like really long filament and can instantly grab people yep they were more willing to help then but that's really like, <laughs> i'm going to cut that rope <laughs> yeah yeah I'm, I'm trying to think like Overall, it it hasn't happened a lot where someone's been grappled long enough to need help. I it did come up one time where uh there was a fight in water. It was relatively shallow water, but there was a grapple. Uh, I think that's what I was using the Rusalka. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, where where water weird. 
s- sort of like that. It was in that the water temple area, but where she- people were grappled <laughs> and then dragged underwater. Because in that yep. case, the grapple's a little more dangerous when um you can't breathe unrelated to the grapple itself, <laughs> but it prevents you from leaving to get to air. I think that's when grapple becomes well, a little more. Or there's yeah. the instance in Out of the Abyss. Uh, this is one of the few times I've had an enemy grapple, but with your ranger, rogue, fighter, cleric character. I really like multi-classing. <laughs> um, you were holding on to, uh, it was like an oh, egg or something. And yeah. a Fomorian comes up who was trying to protect these eggs and is just literally goes to grab you and yank you from the egg. Yeah, purple worm eggs. We were trying to steal purple worm eggs. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> here That's you are yeah here you are like 30 feet in the air as it's trying to just like yank you from this egg and then smash so it doesn't break the egg but it still wants to smash you yeah for reference the purple worm eggs are like suspended almost in like this webbing from the ceiling so we needed one for a mm-hmm. quest and it was almost like a high sort of thing we're figuring out how to like climb up to the ceiling and like cut an egg free and then like slowly gently lower it to the ground without <laughs> smashing it so we could deliver it for our quest um yeah so he tried to yank me off the egg so that i would you know fall to my death which was really uh, feasible for that character because I did not have a lot of hit points. Um, so I think you did that where it was sort of like a contested. Well, initially it was um, if I, I did it as two separate kind of grapple checks on you because you're just clinging to this egg. <laughs> like, so the first one was, can you like slip out and so he can't get a hold on you? But once he got a hold on you, then I that at that point it was a forced strength check just to yank you off the egg. Strength I, for strength. Yeah, I did not have any strength at all. No, so, once um, he grabbed you, that was it. Because he had a plus like seven or eight to pull you from it. And you had a zero. A zero. <laughs> <laughs> but I did have luck points because I took the lucky feat. So <laughs> I did not die. <laughs> but overall, I yeah, I think grapple is one of those things I often forget about. Like I forget mm-hmm. it exists until yeah. it comes up. <laughs> So I used grapple with the kids, uh, but I didn't use like all the rules uh, because they're kids and they can't, they can barely gas- grasp which one's the D20 still. So right. <laughs> I kept it light, um, <laughs> but basically it was a small brawl and they loved it because I had, uh, it was two characters, both unarmored, and it was basically just checks against each other. Um, and the goal was to either knock the other person down to zero hit points or to push them out of the circle. Like so we used grapple. <laughs> yes, yeah, so I used grapple that they could grab the other character and drag them to the edge of the circle. Mm-hmm. But if they stepped out of the circle to pull them with them, then they would be out. So then they, once they got to the edge, they had to try to push them. And they really liked that. That does sound actually pretty that's, funny. That pretty <laughs> that was a really good time. They were really into it. <laughs> Unfortunately, she lost um, the one girl that was grappling the NPC <sighs> because... She got her down to one hit point oh. and then kept trying to push her out of the circle, oh. but she didn't know that she only had one hit point left. Yeah. Oh. And I was like, I was like, well, you could punch her again. And she's like, no, I'm going to push her out of the circle. I was like, okie dokie. <laughs> yeah, it didn't go so well. <laughs> Sounded fun, though. But I would yeah. Like player characters do that against each other. I think that would be pretty cool. <laughs> yeah. I think it would be really fun to watch Uthal and Ash try to. <laughs> Push yeah. each other. Oh, actually... in, in our game, Uthal is Tony's uh, Goliath fighter, and Ash is Rachel's um, Earth Jadasi paladin. So they're both very meaty, <laughs> very, very strength and con based. Yep. Yeah. A little hit point sex. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, overall, I I think part of me is like I need to keep in mind that grappling is a thing more. Yeah. Often. Uh, it definitely is fun to use, like, oh, yeah. on the rare occasion. I don't think I would like to use it a lot. Um, and I know back in, like, one small campaign that we sort of ran with one person, we gra- Chris, uh, I was playing a monk character, and this was back in, like, 3.5 rules, which grapple rules and that were so convoluted. So convoluted. I couldn't even tell you how it worked. Um, <laughs> but all I remember is I grappled it, and then his character came up and because it was essentially knock prone and all the the other conditions that applied because I knocked him on the ground and had him grappled. He was just like, I'm going to coup de gras the lich. And (laughs) and our DM was like, so this was supposed to take like an hour and you did it in two rounds. These things happen. (laughs) I don't miss coup de gras. At all. No, at all either. (laughs) Uh, It can be really fun when it goes your way. Yep. But then also other times, even when it does go your way, you're like, huh. That was unsatisfying. I mean, yeah. It's satisfying if it's a nice long combat. 
Right. Yeah, but if it's right away, it's just, okay, yeah. you murdered a guy. Yeah, if you're like, red yeah. place, red top, I'm a murderer. Yay. Yeah. <laughs> that was the instance there. So that's a good instance of grapple. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you know there's a grappler feat? I keep forgetting it exists. It's one of those feats mm -hmm. I look at that I go, who takes this? Like, <laughs> I'm sure there's someone who's using it, but it's so specific. I, I guess it would have to be for... A specific I campaign, I maybe? I was about to say, like, if with my character, Uthal, this is one of the feats that I considered at one point, because, uh, just to read it, you get advantage on attack rolls against a creature you are grappling. And considering I did a lot of grappling for a while, that's mm -hmm. not too bad. And in addition to that, if it's only, like, one enemy, the other aspect of the feat is you can use your action, then, to try and pin a creature, which restrains both of you, though. Okay. <laughs> You're locked in a fight to the death. Like but that yeah. means that like one if there's just out. one I was about to say if there's just one enemy and you're trying not to kill them, this is a way you could by mm. rules as written, just like take them out and the rest of the party can then just help you out, tie them up, and then okay, you're done. So maybe that's a piece we haven't really addressed yet is like how grappling can be used to not kill enemies. Because I mean, I have to say more often than not, the solution to most combat is to, you know, kill <laughs> kill your antagonists. Loot their bodies and move right. on with your day. But there are times when, especially in my game, where I plan for them to do that, and then they're like, "Let's keep one alive." We're questioning, then interrogate. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But I think grappling could definitely help you there, especially if someone's tried to make their getaway. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. In one of our sessions, when they were, uh, when my players were in what I call the royal playground, they were in a room <laughs> where the whole point was just to try to stay awake. And that's oh. when the big strong guys came in and started grappling everybody. <laughs> and in order to help them fall asleep, I had them try to suffocate the the player characters. <laughs> oh, <gosh. laughs> so using grapple as a first step to that was really fun. And it gave them a sense of urgency, like, I really have to get out of this. Oh my gosh, yeah. Oh, that's scary. <laughs> just Not big, for you, obviously. hands on faces. Yeah, oh, gosh. you're just like... It'll all be fine. Don't worry. You'll wake up or not. You know. Just go to sleep. Just go to sleep. sleep. It's fine. So another thing is kind of we were looking at ways that you can get advantages on breaking out of grapples. Um, one is there uh, is an ability if you're uh, like a, a small race, like a dwarf or I think a half leg. There's a squat nimbleness. This is is this a feat? It's a newer there? feat in the. Uh, oh gosh, Santa. is it Santa's guide? Santa's guide. Yeah, I forgot to put that in there. Uh, I was wondering where that one came from. Yeah, and it basically uh, gives you a additional strength or dex. You get to walk a little faster, and you get proficient in stuff. So it's more like you're like, haha, I'm so small and dodgy. I could just slip out of these things. But uh, I don't know. I, I think with feats, I've often look at feats, and I'm like, that's interesting. And then I think, but there seem things that are more useful. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> broader usage. I always think about what I'm giving up when I look at feats. Yeah, but opportunity this, cost. <laughs> mm -hmm. But this one does include a good stat bonus, like strength or dex to go up by one and yeah. increases your walking speed. I mean, if you're a halfling, you can finally walk 30. That's really <laughs> nice. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's been well, joked that I, that I prejudice against some of the shorter races because I look at the movement speed. I'm always like, oh, the whole time, all the time. Well, the, hard. the one final benefit of squat nimbleness is it does give you advantage on athletics or acrobatics to break a grapple to get out of yeah. it. Yeah. Like if you're a... or to an, I mean you have proficiency yeah, or like, double like proficiency yeah. in athletics. Yeah. yeah, and if you're trying to grab somebody that might be really handy. Like yep. imagine yeah, I, a little halfling just I, holding onto an orc, keeping him down. Yeah, a halfling like, rogue. Yeah, yeah, a strength-based <laughs> halfling rogue. <laughs> <laughs> who's like really burly <laughs> small but powerful <laughs> they just drop letters that would be a really interesting character <laughs> it would be weird combat it would be weird combat so i'm trying to think what else there also there's a the rangers uh monster slayer uh archetype which i actually think is pretty cool we had a a, a player who played the uh the monster slayer and uh made sense for when you're going to be in the underdark there's a lot of monsters yep. um so you know makes sense but it also has an ability where uh if you're being grappled i think it's by like <clears throat> is it your favorite enemy tony that well you can... they have a, a special ability called slayer's prey so they can use i'll just read it really quickly a bonus action to target one creature 
within 60 feet. And the first time each turn that you hit this target, you can deal an extra D6 of damage from a weapon. Hmm. Um, it's uh, lasts until you finish a short or long rest. Uh, and then as part of that, which is the supernatural defense ability, um, whenever this target forces you to make a saving throw or whenever you make an ability check to escape that target's grapple, you add a D6 to the roll. Which I think is interesting. There aren't a lot of abilities that aren't like advantage or disadvantage, but say add a D6. So you could be adding six or one. Yeah, just add <laughs> plus 10 to your stealth. But I guess if you're going up against a really big burly monster and you, who you think will try to pin you down as a ranger, it, it, it could help. I don't think it came yeah. up. But it, it seems very situational. Like very there's this situational. dedicated ability here, but you have to get grappled by enemies first. I think the <laughs> one other benefit is the fact you can add it to a saving throw from the creature. Ah, that I would take in a heartbeat. Then <laughs> we're at that point, uh, and we're playing the the campaign that I'm running, where the you know the PCs are high enough level that it's less about AC and more about saving throws, and they're becoming very very conscious of the importance of making good saving throws. I don't yep. know what you're talking about. I'm so sorry that it's not the saving throws you want for your character. Rachel's like, wisdom and charisma. And I'm like, sorry, it's it's a deck saving throw. It's a deck. <laughs> it's always a deck. <laughs> it's so often decks. So, and I have zero decks. <laughs> yeah. See, my players would love that. They all have good decks. Oh, there are gosh. so few things that require strength saving throws. So yeah. few things. <laughs> it's true. Well, that was, uh, that was my game out of the abyss. All the players were high decks characters. None of them were strength based. Yeah, but I'm trying to think, there aren't that many times strength saving those really do come up. Mm -hmm. I mean, besides someone's, like, pushing you? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. Yeah, I'm trying to visualize when I've ever made or tried to make a strength saving throw. Trying to hold on to somebody or something. Yeah. Like, that's yeah. another. Like, yeah. if somebody's falling, you grab them to hold on and pull them up. I think we've used it for something like that. Yeah, that's true. If it's sort of like what you basically would be doing athletics, but something that you aren't initiating. Or them. carrying people. Well, that's I'm, not really a saving. Oh, yeah, it's not saving through. That's just yeah. a check. That would probably end up being athletics or endurance type stuff. <laughs> endurance type stuff. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. But th th there's also con. So I don't know. It's definitely, there's a lot of squirreliness around a lot of like saving throws and mm -hmm. skill checks where there's some amount of like DM's judgment on, I think this fits this. And sometimes, mm -hmm. that, you know, players lobby for it. But if I look at it this way. Could I make this into this kind of check? <laughs> but if I'm using rope, isn't it now dex? Yeah. <laughs> I would use a rope to lasso someone to catch them. Would that not be <laughs> dex, dex based, not strength based? It's a dex to grab them, but it's a strength to restrain them and not yes. get carried away. <laughs> yeah, not have your arm get pulled off as you're trying to hold on to someone. Yeah. Overall, I guess I guess I have some. I don't want to say prejudices, but I have some biases since I don't, I've never played a, a strength based player character. So I often don't approach these things from like a strength based well, mindset. So I think that's why I, I forget about grappling a lot. <laughs> well, also just looking at strength says, I looked it up really quickly. There's only like a dozen, if that many spells that require it, while there's like six dozen deck saves. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Sorry, Rachel. And there's all of like three wisdom. <laughs> no, there's lots of wisdom there's saves. There's actually a good amount of wisdom. Like, bards do a lot of wisdom saves. Yeah. Too. Yeah. yeah. 30 parts. It's usually dominate or something along those yeah. lines. Charm type spells, right? Things where they're trying yep. to take advantage of your mind. Well, there's some charisma saves too there. Yeah. Speaking of spells, Misty Step is an amazing spell. Oh, yeah. So that's, uh, yes. actually, that's a question I think has come up. Uh, like when you use a spell that lets you just suddenly move, are you just out of a grapple if you were being grappled? That's something we haven't talked about. Oh, According that's to true. the rules, yeah. Like if yeah. You teleport, uh, I know one of the things the rules mentions is like Thunder Wave, which pushes people. But I think yeah. it's going to be pushing both yeah. the grappler and the grappler. Right. They, sort of, <laughs> they go together. Like maybe like have another grapple check as they're being tossed. It's like if two people are wrestling around, get thrown out, they might still be grappled. Yeah, it's yeah. um, it ends if the effect removes the grappled creature from the reach of the grappler or grappling effect. Mm -hmm. So I would say, yeah, um, I mean, Thunder Wave, yeah, you're pushing both of them most likely, <laughs> and it's gonna be painful. <laughs> it's gonna hurt unless it's the person that's being grappled does Thunder Wave, right? Oh, that's true. Because how true. would that work? 
If they turn around and they're like, you're holding my shirt collar, but mwaha, thunder wave. <laughs> yeah, but then would they be pulled with the person that they're That's, thunder waving? I feel like oh. the person doing the grappling would have to make like a, a strength check to hold on or something. Or maybe that's what? the time you can do a strength save. Yeah. Because it yes! actually <laughs> that would be a strength save. But yeah, it actually does say it any effect that removes the grappled creature from the reach of the grappler. Yeah. Mm. The grappler from the grapple. Yeah. Based off rules as written. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if you want to get real granular, the grappled creature didn't move. Nope. That's why we're here. We're here to get real <laughs> granular. <laughs> we're here to go. I also think it would be really fun to try to like blast somebody away from you, but they still yeah. hold on your shirt. They're still trying to then you get yanked with them. <laughs> <laughs> it creates a really entertaining visual. Oh, I'm not gosh. sure how the players would feel about it. I think they'd be like, that's pretty cool, or what? What just happened? What is happening? I, I'm just sure, like, yes, I knocked him back 15 feet, and I'm going with him. Oh, gosh. Oh. <laughs> yeah, I think strength save would be the way to go in that case. That makes the most sense to me. To hold on. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because it doesn't make sense that it should just be like an insta-fail necessarily. But, yeah. Yeah, I'd, I'd say strength save. So... Yeah, I'd agree with that. Are you coming up with something diabolical, Rachel? Or... No, so... I, was like, I thought there was another one that did like a out a burst out from you. There's like a wall of wind, I think, that can push people or gust of wind. Yeah, because that's a line of wind that blasts from you in a direction you choose, and those have to make a strength save or be pushed back. So I think it would be the same; it'd be a strength save if they're holding on to you and you mm -hmm. do this gust of wind directly oh. from your center. <laughs> what? what? <laughs> Thunderous smite. Oh, the oh, yeah. is ten feet. And they're not uh, thrown. That's true. So you think strength save in that case too to allow people to try to continue collaring you? Yeah. So yeah, because yeah, it says they have to do a strength saving throw or be pushed ten feet away from you. So. So what we're learning yeah. is we need to like workshop this with like some player characters. Be like, all right, you guys, your job is to hold on to the other person. Your job is to escape. Use whatever methods you have at your disposal. Yes. <laughs> we'll have to do some testing. <laughs> we could use your kids. That'd be perfect. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, I guess grapple maybe is a little underrated. I feel a little bad now. Like, <laughs> well, you don't pick strength characters, and like yeah. uh, you were saying earlier, Scott, there's so few skills that go with strength that giving grapple to a strength based character seems the least you can do. <laughs> yeah, I, there's athletics, but then what else do strength based characters get? They're yeah. really good at jumping. They can jump so well. <laughs> they can carry a lot of things. Oh, Actually, they can be your pack mule. Good. Good. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's so literally my character up. is. <laughs> we actually haven't discussed size differences. How would you handle that? We brought it up a little bit yeah. with that. Basically. Well, in terms of because of the way the rules are, if a medium creature goes to grapple a large creature, you both just roll. Yeah, there's mm -hmm. no advantage or disadvantage. Right. How would you handle that, Scott? I I think medium versus large. Uh. As long as they're both humanoid creatures, I would just let it happen with a roll. <laughs> let the dice the fall where they may. <laughs> yeah, the difference between like a six foot person and a twelve foot person is like pretty drastic. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but still, like your heroes are strong for a reason, and if they want to jump up and headlock this dude. All right. Or maybe they're just grabbing them around the legs and keeping them from moving anywhere. <laughs> they're just sort of wrapping themselves around the kneecaps of the monster, being like, ha ha, try to get away now, sucker. <laughs> <laughs> Which is something I could see some some player characters doing. I don't know what you're talking about. It's a great uh -huh. distraction. It's a funny image. It's a funny image. Yeah. That's really what we've determined. Any grappling is a, invariably becomes a funny image at some point. <laughs> yep. But uh, yeah, any size discrepancy bigger than that. It's like, how are you even yeah. trying to control this creature physically? Yeah, you say, yeah, if you're like a gnome and there's like, I don't know, a giant crocodile and you go up and you try to like mm -hmm. pin them down by holding their toes. Like You weigh so little compared to them. Yeah. Yeah. And... I guess it's no. sort of like, you know, like having a strong. half. If you're super strong, <laughs> half leg. <laughs> you just took a potion of giant strength and you're like, no. But it's like Scott's point about the weight, because even if you're really strong, but you weigh 40 pounds. <laughs> yeah. If you took a potion of giant strength, why don't you just go over there and pick them up and throw them? <laughs> <laughs> why don't you just punch them in the head? <laughs> 
if you're a superhero, why not just go all the way and go with the punching or smashing at that point? Maybe you yeah. want to question the giant crocodile. You can knock them unconscious. <laughs> So one thing that actually we realized I had the questions we didn't talk about yet uh, is characters who have multi-attack uh, if they want to mm-hmm. do grapples as like replacing one of their attacks. Of course, this comes up with the same character, Tony's character, Hi. who's a fighter, who's like, all right, so can I replace like my first attack with a grapple and then, you know, For slash with my long him. sword <laughs> or punch him in the face mm-hmm. or the way around, punch him in the face, you know, soften him up a little bit, then grapple him. And I think I've allowed it because generally for most checks, a check is an action in combat, mostly because we sort that's sort of an inference in the rules from my understanding, but also because it just keeps combat moving quickly. But I don't know, would you allow a grapple check to replace uh, replace an attack for a multi-attack character, Scott? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we've got a monk in our game. And he does not grapple people. He's not strong at all. <laughs> but he can make a ton of attacks. And if he really wanted to, like, jump on somebody's back and just start wailing on him. <laughs> absolutely. That's why they get multi-attack, is to like be more versatile hand-to-hand. We also have a monk in our game, and every turn I'm like, what do you want to do? And he's like, I would like to punch them in the face. And I'm like, what? <laughs> Didn't yeah. see that coming at all. Oh, you'd like to do it again? And again, it's been a key mm-hmm. point for Flurry of Woes and go again. Yeah, yeah. So I guess I think we've generally allowed that mostly, like you said, for that kind of versatility and get more flexibility for characters who are just going to be repeatedly doing the same thing anyways. Yeah. And if you had the choice between I make five attacks or I just hold somebody, <laughs> yeah. you're never going to hold yeah. them. You're going to just pummel. <laughs> yeah. I like when you say hold them. It makes it sound like you're going to like comfort them. But I want to hold them. <laughs> if you fail your check, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Awkwardly sort of like massage their shoulders as, as they pull away from you. And you're like, oh, leaves you hanging like an awkward oh. hug. Okay, so here's another question, though. Let's say you have a multi-attack, so you have two attacks, and you yeah. try to grapple with your first and you miss. Can you try yeah. to grapple, grapple again? Sure. Yeah. Yes. Like, like, no, I really want to I hold want you. This. I want this so bad. <laughs> Let me give you a hug. <laughs> yeah, I guess you could. I mean, for the most part, I feel like in the t- the times grapple checks have happened in our games, they're almost a foregone conclusion because they tend to be a really strong character versus a really weak character. So it's not a lot of tension. Right. Um, plus 11 to grapple. Well, yeah, but you actually are, usually you aren't grappling very strong things because... I mean, what's the point of that? But I guess you could. I don't know. It's it's. We need to have more exciting grapple checks. I think All is right. what we're determined. So it actually does say in the player's guide under grappling as a special attack option. Uh, if you're able to make multiple attacks with the attack action, this attack replaces one of them. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, so I yeah. guess if you get to the level where you have four attacks, you could just keep, keep trying to grapple if you yeah. fail. The sad <laughs> thing is now. Four times. Now I'm picturing, like, your monk could essentially, like, if he has got two enemies, just grab one in each hand. Yep. Well, wait, can you, grapple two, en- can you grapple two enemies at once? <laughs> and then say, you can't, as long as you have a free hand. <laughs> yeah. Well, but I think if you're grappling two enemies and you're kicking them, what are you standing on? Like, I have some questions. One and then you kick with the other. <laughs> have you not seen Jackie Chan? Like, <laughs> grab people yeah. and just raise both your legs up? <laughs> I, I guess that's true. There you go. So I just need to visualize most player characters who are amongst this Jackie Chan and that'll, yeah. that. Then it'll all make sense because yeah. that all is like physics bending <laughs> nonsense that I love but don't understand at all. My brain's yeah. like, how does the human body do that? Yeah, while well, the enemies are flanking you, you just grab each one on either side and start kicking. Yeah, I mean, well, one thing go. that I have to remind our monks sometimes is, yeah, you have unarmed attacks, but that doesn't mean you have to use your fists. Like, mm-hmm. headbutt a guy. Elbow, knee him, kick him, like whatever you want. Yeah, it's, it's the opposite problem for our monk where he has special gauntlets. So he literally wants to be clear. I am punching them with mm-hmm. my magical uh, gauntlets. I don't want, no, just punching with my hands. <laughs> Otherwise, yeah, it's definitely supposed to be more fluid, right? And not generally just. But he is one? also mirrored after one punch man. Yes. 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 He uh, has focused on punching as his, as his so. destiny. <laughs> <laughs> it is his destiny. <laughs> but yeah, I definitely think. Mm-hmm. Grappling is maybe more fluid than we'd given it credit for, but we don't ever, I've never given advantage or disadvantage on anything grappling related. I think it, Tony has asked a couple of times, like, okay, because this is happening, like, oh, if they're prone, how does that affect, affect grappling? Like, does it change it at all? Or like, would it be easier or harder? And we've decided it's just going to be the same level of difficulty. I was curious what you thought. Yeah, that's probably fair. 
I mean, someone who's on the ground prone uh, is already in a bad spot. Yeah. <laughs> and they should be very lucky that they're only getting grappled and not stabbed with advantage. Yes, yep. <laughs> that, that is true. That has come up a few times. <laughs> so I think we've we've kind of come to some sort of conclusion on grappling, which is, uh, yeah, we don't use it a lot. It's, but It's underrated, I think, a little but bit. But it can be fun. <laughs> Yeah, it just oh, requires yeah. more thinking, planning, yeah. Yeah. creativity. Mm -hmm. I think creativity is maybe the part that that I think has eluded us where we just think of it as doing the one thing, but it's a little more flexible. You're just restraining them, right? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> restraining them. No, they're just grappled. No, they're not pinned. No, they can still attack you. Time. Oh, <laughs> You're right. so going to bring that up next game. You'd be like, so now that I have them grappled, they um, are completely helpless, right? Ash That's wouldn't right. grapple anybody. You know no. that. No, I don't. No, she's she's going to smack them. <laughs> yeah. So. Travel and survival, by which I think we meant how do players get from point A to point B when it's not close by? <laughs> <laughs> in some ways sometimes for our sessions it goes very quickly because as a dm sometimes i'm like they're going from one safe place to another relatively safe place like a small town to a city nearby and there isn't a lot of i don't know bandits on the road or something like that murdered them all but then nice. other times it's like you know sometimes you're traveling in the underdark where literally everything is trying to kill you so <laughs> Yep. yep. <laughs> yeah. Uh, we have not been traveling in the Underdark at all. Everything's been overland. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but I tend to stay away from random encounters mm -hmm. unless I really have absolutely nothing prepared for them when they get to where they're going. <laughs> You're like, sorry, guys, I this is what I've got. <laughs> I usually try to like plan on an actual fight with somebody that represents a group or a faction that they currently have issues with or I want them to have issues with. Uh, so it's like, oh, yeah, you're going to meet some servants of this guy you pissed off and they're going to try to kidnap you or they're going to just try to kill you here in the snow. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh. That's bleak. But I guess sort of having it like have, make sense for story reasons, because I think otherwise uh, it's really easy for travel to turn into the Oregon Trail. Mm -hmm. The computer game, not the historical reference. Um, <laughs> I really like the Oregon Trail, by the way, the old computer game. You know, you stockpile your wagon and you venture yeah. forth. And we definitely have had elements of that show up in our campaigns, especially when it comes to food and yep. survival. <laughs> like, did you pack mm -hmm. enough rations? Do you need to go hunting? Do you have any skills at that whatsoever? Or are you going to eat poisonous plants and, you know, suffer the consequences? Poop your brains out. I mean, it hasn't happened, but it could. <laughs> <laughs> it hasn't happened, but there's the threat. Yeah, yeah. So I, I definitely try to stay away from random encounters too, because I think it's just well, something small here or there can be fun. If it seems totally haphazard, then the players are kind of mm. like, "What was the point of that?" And you're like, "I'm yeah. sorry, there was no point." I uh, that's what I have. Yeah. yeah. How many packs of wolves can we fight on this road? Oh, Seriously. Rachel, you have a story about a pack of wild animals that were <laughs> unexpectedly difficult. <laughs> you mean from Lost Minds of Fandover, where they <laughs> literally TPK'd my whole party? <laughs> <laughs> it was just like regular wolves, right? Um, it was it was three wolves and a bugbear. <gasps> but they all have pack tactics. So yeah, uh, yeah, and they were level one. My players. <laughs> Oh, that's a shame. Yeah. <laughs> Couldn't be helped. <laughs> yeah. And it was like, okay, I'm going to roll with advantage. And I crit again. I'm going to roll with advantage. And I crit again. How many hit points mm -hmm. do you have again? I don't know. Not enough. Yeah. <laughs> so, do you ever uh, allow a chance that your players might get lost when they're traveling? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> it, it already happened. Uh oh. <laughs> Tell us they, the story. <laughs> Do tell. They were returning to go see a half dragon friend of theirs uh, who was working on something for them. And he lives out in a cave away from town in this very snowy area. So I threw in a blizzard. Ooh. And just like, because they had been there a few times and like to get there, yeah, they know the way. But mm -hmm. when you can't see anything, <laughs> like, all right, roll survival a few times. Oh, God. See what you see. And no, it just did not work. <laughs> like, <laughs> all bad rolls. Luckily, there were a few other things I was adding. Like, there were some lights in the sky, and they were able to kind of navigate that way. But 
on the way back, they totally got lost. Uh, on oh. the bright side, they got to meet a wonderful group of wild halflings, though. Oh, okay. <laughs> Charming, who prevented them from getting lost and dying of hypothermia, which would be a really sad TPK. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, to death. Well, yeah. to be yeah. fair, it wouldn't have been a TPK because they had split the party at that time. Oh, so oh. Just, <laughs> just half the party. They would just never find out what other what happened to the other half of the party. It would be like, and then they just wandered mm -hmm. off into the mountains, never to be seen again. <laughs> <laughs> That's so That's sad. It. Yeah. Uh, when we were doing Out of the Abyss, uh, when I was building my character, I knew it was going to be in the Underdark because, you know, Tony always makes sure we have the background of what the campaign's going to be. And I'm an like, idea. so like, so what are the chances we get lost and starve to death? And Tony's like, oh, uh, fair. <laughs> so I was like, well, okay, I will it, be playing a ranger. <laughs> it's like a minimum of 10 days of travel to any place. Yeah. Most places took 20 days to get to. Jeez. So, so this yeah, is also why I don't do random encounters. Yeah. Well, yeah. Yeah, otherwise you'd spend all the whole campaign rolling on the random encounter table. But I decided the best thing to do would be to build a ranger and pick the Underdark as my favorite terrain. Because you get some uh, crucial bonuses, like you don't uh, get slowed by difficult terrain for your group. And you mm -hmm. can't become lost except by magical means. So you don't get disoriented just by confusing tunnels and wander around until mm -hmm. you starve to death. You wouldn't get lost in a blizzard if the Arctic were your favorite terrain. Yep. <laughs> No, you know, we don't have a ranger. I know people are down <laughs> on rangers, but when they stop you from getting hypothermia, you should be grateful. <laughs> Maybe I'll pick up one level of ranger on on my paladin. I told you you should. <laughs> it would be great. They get some really handy abilities. But I want my my ability to be able to navigate those crystal caverns we went through. Mm. Yeah, so there's that's some my favorite terrain. <laughs> favorite terrain. Anything that looks cool and shiny. shiny. <laughs> yeah, I don't think that's listed. I think it's things like Arctic, desert, forest. That's more what they mean instead of Earth. Like, yeah. Or no, we can't have the Earth as your favorite terrain. <laughs> Can my favorite terrain be the Tomb of Horrors? I know where. Yes, yes I would like. Great. The whole, the whole dungeon scape will be my favorite terrain. Yes, yes, dungeons is my favorite terrain. <laughs> not how it works guys <laughs> uh, hey but, for the underdark though yeah you do get the whole yeah, underdark as your the entire campaign. underdark if it's gonna that be underdark like campaign. A, a massive space so yeah. yeah 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 it was a good it was a good investment for my character to, to start out as a ranger because we did not get lost well except for by magic because of course there is that loophole that says you can't get lost except for by magical means so of course tony is like yeah. Okay, so there's Imagine. one one thing, <laughs> one place in the entire campaign that is specifically hidden by magic. So it's like, yeah, I know where it is. You can't get to it until you go to the proper place. Mm -hmm. Yep. So uh, another thing that comes up is like food in the campaign. We're playing the Prince of the Apocalypse. You spend a lot of your time like going mm -hmm. to small towns where it's easy to get food. Have any guys had that come up where like food shortages or foraging is something the players have to think about? Uh, we've kind of skipped that whole part, uh, mostly because they're traveling with a merchant in my game uh, who just happens to have like, some food stuffs like fish jerky. And he's got contacts in different towns. So and also, I didn't want them going out and having to hunt every once in a while. Yeah, it can become a lot of those things we have to be careful. I know we've had a danger in our games of going like a Sims route where we spend a lot of time <laughs> in game just taking care of basic needs. And then you're like, what are we doing? This isn't D&D. &D. <laughs> it's not really D&D. &D. Go play Stardew Valley if we want to harvest crops. <laughs> yeah. There's nothing wrong with that. I do like harvesting crops. <laughs> I know. <laughs> it's just not what D&D is for. I think as long as they're in a place where food is conceivably available... Like, yeah, we could do that. Unless we were going to do a whole campaign where it was, like, traveling this dangerous area across, like, a whole continent to get somewhere. And, like, the trip itself was the danger. Like, yeah. Eh, not to take away from rangers, but, yeah, I'm going to take away from rangers. <laughs> <laughs> hey! <laughs> it's okay, I get it. <laughs> yeah. That's why she was a ranger rogue fighter cleric. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, got to keep your options open. Well, and an easy way to get around the whole, like, rangers, like, being able to find is if they are traveling over the whole continent, like, they're going to go through multiple yeah. biomes and environments. So, right. like, yeah. 
change. You're good in one out of five. <laughs> yeah. Or you have a cleric that can create food and water. Or you have a ranger cleric that can create food and water. Well, <laughs> well rangers can just make good berries, but yeah. but it's a spell slot. Yep. Oh, we, but it works for the whole day. You just yeah. do that it, at the end of the day. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Enjoy the world's most delicious and nutritious berry. <laughs> and you get one HP. I did also do that because we had to worry about food. So yeah. yeah. That I was just the player that was like making sure the group didn't die from non monsters and then, you know, monsters mm. were a whole separate issue. Yeah. <laughs> uh, another thing that comes up with traveling a lot, even if it's somewhere that's not super dangerous, is how alert the party is to danger by which i mean in our campaign everyone's like i just want to be totally clear that while we're traveling i am paying attention at all times 100 percent alert mm -hmm. looking for danger mm -hmm. perceiving actively Using you know wink wink yeah. <laughs> so that's like kind of the question of like surprise how does that work it's that's sort of a bigger separate topic but do you have like a lot of ambushes you think in in travel um we've had one ambush which was partially successful because yeah they did have somebody up front just always perceiving around mm -hmm. so when it got to the area where i knew they were going to be ambushed I'm like okay go ahead and roll it <laughs> they, they spotted the enemies on the road just not the ones off the side of the road oh. <laughs> oh. Oops. partial credit <laughs> yeah 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 they they knew there was going to be danger so they were able to stop and like get their weapons ready and not be totally caught flat-footed. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's definitely interesting. Like, survival in general is... It's kind of weird that there's a survival check and it's hard to explain to new players that it doesn't mean, no, you're not rolling to, like, see Survive. if you live or die. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's more just, how good are you at doing the things that are surviving? Can you mm -hmm. track? Can you find food? Can you find food that is not poisonous? <laughs> That's the exactly. other thing. <laughs> Finding food that won't kill you. Like, these berries look great. Look how pretty they are. I'm sure there's <laughs> nothing wrong with them. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. I always think back to the, the Simpsons clip where it tastes like burning. <laughs> 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 these things could definitely happen. Um one thing that we actually, Tony and I were looking at is in Xanathar's Guide, they kind of have an expanded mm. tool section. And actually, the, some of mm. the tools that are available sort of can uh, combine with survival as a skill proficiency, like cartographer's tools. And I don't know why this is, but I seem to always have a player who wants to make maps in every game I'm in. <laughs> where they're like, so in this first time, uh, my player, my character has been working on this map. And if we meet a new NPC and they mention a place, I'm going to whip out my map. They can draw or show me where this is on the map. I'll add this to the mm. map. It really makes it hard for them to get lost when they get really specific directions, write them down, and then also do careful cartography. <laughs> yes. <laughs> With survival checks. <laughs> mm. I mean, um, if they're going to put their stats into that ability to be good map makers. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. You will, and you only need one party member to do it. Everyone else just goes, well, we'll just follow the map because mm -hmm. I don't follow the map. They did a pretty good job. Yeah. But so <laughs> Rachel is that player, by the way, my game. Who's like, that player. <laughs> and draw map and like, okay. <laughs> We're here. We need to get here. This is the fastest route, but we do know there's harpies. Let's go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, but I don't know if that's common in a lot of people's games. I just happen to have players who like map making. It's it's never happened in mine, <laughs> which hey, if they wanted to, that's fine. I've got rough maps of the areas they go to, <laughs> but mm -hmm. like I'm not gonna penalize them for not having maps. No, it's no. Just, yeah. How yeah. much do you prepare for this journey? Yeah. A map is one way to do it. Yeah. Talking yeah. to other people is another. Yeah, inquiring, asking directions, generally not saying, well, I think we know enough. It's somewhere east. Let's just mm. sally forth and see what happens. <laughs> Where is directly east? Let's go that way. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so in general, I I'm pretty straightforward with when they get a quest. Typically, they have someone who gives them some kind of directions as to where it would be like, uh, yeah. it's south of that town. And then mention the name of the town and the players are like, okay, mm. yeah, we can do we know where we're going. Do, yeah. do, do, do. Just like name of a town, name of a major geographical feature. Mm -hmm. mm. Yep. Anything that's like, yeah, if we go there, we'll find it. Yeah. Yeah. Especially if it's like they're looking for a large monster. They're like, okay, we probably can find some indications that it has been around, like mm -hmm. large tracks and that sort of thing. 
So and it's also fun when you do have like the wisdom based characters who are good at some of those checks and get to be like, ha I am valuable. <laughs> I'll do a thing. I'm good at tracking. <laughs> yeah. Especially also combine that with like nature checks. So I have the most petty travel complaint ever as a DM. <laughs> and I would like to voice it here, <laughs> which uh -oh. is I hate carts <laughs> and carriages <laughs> and vehicles uh -oh. <laughs> because they always want to take them, but they don't know how to drive them. <laughs> <laughs> well, and there's always the issue that like Uthal weighs like 700 pounds, so you hey. can get him plus everybody in the cart. So we have to take two carts, and then it's the, well, who's in which cart, and who's driving the other cart? And, and they're, mm. like, going to a town that's, like, four hours away, and then they're like, all right, but we want to hire a cart. What carts are available? Or do they have carriages? Tell us more about the specific details of the vehicles. The cushions? How much does it cost to rent versus own? Maybe we do should invest. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> do we have a place to stable the horses? And I'm just like, oh my gosh, you guys, can we just go? <laughs> it's <a> like <slight> meal. <laughs> but, but, yeah. Land vehicles. Do you does it do you guys ever like look at the land vehicles proficiency? Because it only comes up with carts. And I guess maybe maybe it's because I'm a stickler and I should just let it go, but literally only one character knows how to drive a cart. <laughs> uh, it only came up once for us, and that's when the merchant they're traveling with, who actually does have proficiency with his cart, uh, uh -huh. was otherwise preoccupied and they had to get away fast. Uh oh. <laughs> so all right, who's driving the cart? Oh, none of us know how to drive the cart. <laughs> okay, who's best with animals? Just give me that much. <laughs> yeah, Telling yeah. horses what to do, just come on. Yeah. The horses should be smarter than us. They know how to drive the cart. We'll just let them follow the road. They still need to be guided. Yeah, and I think it came up where someone's like, it's a fantasy world. We should all know how to drive carts. And I'm like, yeah, like in the real world, how we all you know, just know how to drive a car, you know? It doesn't require yeah. any special yeah. training. You just do it. <laughs> mm -hmm. So they have made white choices in the end, so there have been no tragic cart accidents, but yeah, that's my least favorite part of travel. Carts. <laughs> <laughs> carts. <laughs> I'm okay with carts. I like them. See? It eliminates a whole lot of the worries about, like, we need to bring stuff with us, or we're escorting somebody. Or we need a place out of the rain. Just like get in the cart. Just get a cart. Just, just well, they've looked, or just pay a guy to drive it. Like hire, hire, hire a chauffeur for your yeah. cart. Yeah. For people. If you're already a rich adventurer. Yeah. Oh, weather. We have not talked about weather. Yeah. yeah. Well, in my campaign, we weather was not an issue because you were underground the whole time. Under dark, yeah. not a lot of weather. Right. Yeah. And ours were above ground. Uh, the weather's really only come into play a few times, like with the blizzard. Mm -hmm. uh, there are certain places they've traveled to where there's less daylight than others. Uh, so just being able to see in the dark or having light sources came up, but they have yet to go to some place that was exceptionally hot. Mm -hmm. Taking that into account, or I mean, there are places they're cold, but I'm like, buy a coat, you'll be fine. <laughs> <laughs> so in running prince of the apocalypse since they're uh fighting the elemental cults um you know mm. heat and wind and rain are all very important so i've learned unless there's something cult driven the weather has to be perfect or they assume literally everything yep. is coming from the cultists and sometimes like one time i just had it rain and they're like it's raining the water cult is attacking and i was like well when nothing else is happening yeah all like for <laughs> for days and weeks and then all of a sudden it's pouring rain we're like okay this something's wrong there was one time it was just like regular rain but you guys were like ha ha we know and i was like wait okay, was well. this the storm over the feather kill no that was a different thing that was okay, that was from the rain over the forest <laughs> that we were traveling through just random rain yeah yeah so uh, all of the two times it rained in the game i remember pretty much so otherwise yeah. it's always cultists you know bad weather blame it on cultists that's bad, what we've learned yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> That's yeah. <laughs> the only explanation. <laughs> Weather doesn't just happen on its own naturally. No. It's obviously no. magical. Yeah. <laughs> um, I do use it uh, in epic endings for more for flavor um, because I don't really have them like role play the whole um, the whole travel sequences. It's more of a you're going from point A to point B. It's going to take you about a ten day. 
give me a D12. We'll see if you, you know, if it adds, like if you have really bad weather or if you have like really good weather, you get there in the mm-hmm. expected time or if it adds a couple of days. So it's more for flavor than anything. But um, I do use it very like casually. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's not like a massive impact on, on yeah. the, the I mean, ability to just... The other thing though is they're all level 20 characters that are playing already. So they know how to travel oh. in conditions. <laughs> I'm going with that assumption that... They know that if it's going to be raining, they'll take an umbrella. <laughs> <laughs> you know those D and D umbrellas. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Do umbrellas exist in like standard fantasy worlds? I don't think so. No, no, I, I think, think about they have like ponchos. The poncho. Yeah. yeah. They would Big take the rain hats. slicker. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Like floppy hats is definitely what I would picture more, or waterproofed sort of like oil slick mm-hmm. kind of clothes. Yeah. yeah. I think we wrapped up weather pretty yeah, well. Uh, we want to give you a chance to talk a little bit about your podcast. I know you mentioned it. I had questions, but uh, if you just want to talk a little bit about Seasons of Skyrend. Absolutely. Uh, Seasons of Skyrend is a 5th edition D&D custom adventure that I started writing a couple years ago. Uh, and we actually started playing about a year ago. So it was a lot of time spent in prep. And the premise behind this was to see how to see how my players would interact in a world where the rulers and even the gods are kind of just out for their own best interest. And how exactly do the players interact with that world? Do they want to support the system? Do they want to fight against the system? How important is religion for them? Mm -hmm. Uh, It's kind of a lot of big ideas coming at once at them. Uh, (laughs) Just because really like go get this awesome treasure from a dragon like i feel has been done a lot and yeah once or twice yeah <laughs> just a few times like it's very character driven i want their characters to grow i want them to face hard choices and make decisions that actually impact the world around them uh, like do we actually follow through uh, assisting with this execution by the state okay, we do, but we have a lot of conflicts about it. What do we do after this? Oh, we throw one of our party members on the fire because he spoke out against something. Okay, now we're all on the run from the law. It's just like, just like <laughs> a so, lot of things just cascading over and over again. So you really care about player agency and, and, and then really how they're uh, affecting the narrative. It's not just things that are happening to them. Right. This is definitely meant to be like this small group, these three people, like how are they impacting the world and how is it impacting them in return? Probably the most like unique thing about our world is uh, it doesn't take place in any of the like written Mm D and D scenarios. It's not forgotten realms or anything. Uh, There's a bunch of races that are not included. There's a couple that I've had to create just for fun. The whole planet is kind of seasonally locked. So up at the North Pole, it's summer, the South Pole, it's winter. So when they're traveling across the world, they're literally traveling through the seasons. And it's like, oh, they start out in fall where it's actually kind of nice and cool. And oh, they travel to winter. It's just bitterly cold there. So that's why you want to talk about travel and weather. (laughs) (laughs) A little bit. That's why I'm worried if they ever go north and they're just going to boil under the sun. Um, Oh, man. (laughs) Might be some extreme temperatures up there. They'll have to prepare. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And as the story's unfolded right now, they've they've certainly pissed off a couple of gods. There's the god of the monstrosities who pretty much wants them dead. Uh, They've made a deal with our god of death after a TPK. Oh. That's kind of a driving factor uh, as we move into some of our newer recordings and uh, we're pushing into our second year. Uh, it was actually part of that ambush when they were caught in the snow. Mm-hmm. Uh, oh. So were, have you had any major surprises along the way? Things that did not go at all the way you expected or had considered? That was actually the thing that was... <laughs> okay. Really- oh. <laughs> <laughs> That was the biggest one, because I think in like our fifth or sixth episode uh, was that like one of the last things that I had actually structured to happen before we played any game was they're going to meet the God of Death. He's going to be very pissed off at this NPC, and he's going to call off all undead magics. Like there are no more undead. You can't talk to the dead. 
so if you die, you're dead. Like that's it. Wow. It's gone. Ooh. Ooh. So there was a TPK and two of them were just unconscious. One of them was actually dead dead. Failed all the saving throws. Yeah. And I'm like, oh, this is this is too bad for them. Like, <laughs> <laughs> they're gone. I felt really bad. Um, Rip up their yeah. sheets. <laughs> but, <laughs> no, I, they were all passed out, and so I took them into uh, our God of Death's kind of domain. Like he's going to show up, take their soul. Like no, this is the rules. I'm taking them. Too bad. And they totally surprised me. Like they made a deal with death. I was. No, if you want a good death, if you want a happy afterlife, you just got to die now. Like, no, I don't want a good death. Screw that. <laughs> <laughs> I want to live, darn it. <laughs> Basically sold their soul in order to, like, potentially have a good afterlife. Uh, but now they have to go kill another god. And that's just <sighs> something that I hadn't thought was going to happen until... I mean, narratively, it's very exciting. I'm so sure it's a DM, you're I... like, what? <laughs> yeah, no, it was great. It was the most surprising thing <laughs> they've ever done to me, and I love it. <laughs> That's what, is that one of your favorite moments uh, from, the, from the show so far? Absolutely. Uh, the pair of episodes, uh, Blood in the Snow and Grayscape, which are just uh, two of my favorite, because it's good combat, and then it's a great character piece after that. With them bargaining with death. Wow. wow. Yeah. I'll have to listen to that right away. I want to hear how it all plays <laughs> out. Right away. <laughs> I need to catch up. It's a, <laughs> yeah. It's a little it's a little sad, especially since the one who died was pregnant at the time. Oh no. Uh, oh, so bad. Character oh. or player? The the player. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> no, not the so, character. Oh. <laughs> like, wow, that's oh. going really fast. Like, I didn't want to make a pregnant lady cry. <laughs> <laughs> that's fair. That, that, that's fair. But, you know, actions no. have consequences. Yes, have. They do. Yeah. And that's kind of our whole driving force. It's just like, no, there are consequences. It'll be good or it'll be bad. But it's yep. not just, I'm going to show up to the city, carry out an assassination order, and walk out. It's like, oh no, people care he died. Yeah, yeah. People are invested. <laughs> they have they have hopes and dreams too, even if they're only NPCs. Yeah. yeah. I mean, we had to have a whole trial because they decided, no, we're gonna stick around in town for a few more days. Oh, oh <laughs> wow. <laughs> you're like, I mean, uh, you're welcome to do that if you want. There's a DM, mm -hmm. you're like, no, don't do it. But okay, okay. Town's on you go Nobody in or out. <laughs> yeah. Man. So uh was was Seasons of Skyrim always planned to be a podcast, or was it something you were going to do as just a game and decided to turn it into a podcast, or how did you make that? This one was always intended to be a podcast. We had been playing for a few years beforehand. Uh, we started out with the starter kit and got wildly off track. Yeah, <laughs> as you do. <laughs> In very short order. Uh, I mean, me and a couple of the other players listened to D&D podcasts and like, we could do that. <laughs> that's, story. that's where it begins. It's easy, right? <laughs> oh gosh. <laughs> You're like, we might as well try, right? Yeah. yeah the hubris of it. Pretty yeah. But uh no, it's it was definitely always intended to be a story. That's why like I had to put in a bunch of time ahead of time, like setting the world, setting like creating a whole new pantheon of gods, deciding who was gonna be living where. And then once, like, it, it was a lot of work, but I felt the benefit was once we actually started playing, when they decided, no, I want to go over here instead, like, okay, I know exactly what's in between there. I know what type of people you're going to meet when you get there. So it gives them a whole lot more freedom to just do whatever they want. It's always nice when it can feel like a living, breathing world that your characters are, your player characters are a part of, and not just a place that they go from one, whoop, they pop up over here, and then they have this specific interaction that ha goes this way, and it's, yeah. you know, railroady. It's nice because it can feel more organic, right? Mm -hmm. Certainly taking advantage of that. <laughs> <laughs> Plenty of advantage, huh? <laughs> As players do. So, uh, how did you get into tabletop role playing games? Originally, it yeah. was probably looking through my older brother's monster manuals and players' handbooks from like A, D, and D when I was a kid. And then it was playing games with my cousins. And then not playing for actually a really long time. 
until uh, I started playing with a group at work, playing in 4.5e. I mean, it was a lot of fun, but it was definitely way too micromanagey for my taste. Mm. So when 5e came out, I jumped on that and was like, nope, I'm done. No more 4.5. I don't care. <laughs> playing the story. I, I, we need to, I need to cut it to an end. Like, my character's got to find a way out. <laughs> this new one. I'm out. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You're like, we're, we're all in this to have fun, right? Different things are fun for different people. Yeah, mm -hmm. we've been really happy with the switch to 5e. It's not perfect. Oh, yeah. And the rules, you know, as we no. have found, have loopholes, but it's it's so accessible. Yeah. So thank you so much, Scott, yes. for being our guest on, on Rules is Written. It's been awesome. Oh, well, thank you for having me. Yeah, yeah. thanks. Yeah. Yeah. Always That's enjoy chatting. Dungeons and Dragons with people, especially Talking like shop. getting all nitpicky over rules. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. So thanks again, Scott, and thanks for sharing your promo for Seasons of Skyrend. Hello, listeners. My name is Scott, and I'm the host and DM for Seasons of Skyrend, a custom D and D actual play podcast. We focus on the stories of our characters as they face difficult choices and uncover the secrets of a world where rulers and gods exercise their will as they see fit. Join us and follow our stories every week on iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, and more. We're also on Twitter at Skyrend Podcast. That's Skyrend, S-K-Y-R-E-N-D. And with that, we'll bring this promo to a close. But the story will always continue.